In place of the present state organizations, with their lifeless machinery of political and bureaucratic institutions, anarchists desire a federation of free communities, which shall be bound to one another by their common economic and social interests, and shall arrange their affairs by mutual agreement and free contract. That is how Rudolf Rocker describes his vision for an anarcho-syndicalist society. You see, earlier anarchist philosophers like Kropotkin and Bakunin didn't give much systemic detail as to what an anarchist society should actually look like. They were far more interested in critiquing the state, including the communist state which they despised almost as much as its capitalist counterpart. Whenever they did offer their vision for anarchy, they were remarkably conservative. Kropotkin envisioned a largely traditional society in which men worked while women stayed home to raise their kids. The only real changes were that the men's hours would be shorter, the women would be allowed to work too, and no one would swing by to collect taxes or conscript soldiers. But small anarchist communities don't make sense in an industrialized world. It was the need to bridge this gap that gave rise to anarcho-syndicalism. So you can call me Ezekiel. This is anarcho-syndicalism. Let's jump in! The first thing to understand about anarchism is that it makes no claims to being utopian. Anarchists view themselves not as trying to create a perfect world, but as trying to make the best of the situation they find themselves in. Utopianism is for the state. For what can be more utopian than expecting to find a community of perfect men to run our lives for us by force? Anarcho-syndicalism takes its name from the workers' syndicate. Worker syndicates originated in France as normal trade unions, but with their increasing radicalization, the syndicates became more like political parties. This marriage is important, because anarcho-syndicalists are highly skeptical of political parties. Parties frequently sell out their membership, and even when they do succeed in passing legislation, the words on paper and the reality in the factory don't always match. A law limiting an eight-hour workday or banning child labor does not always have a real-world effect. Such rules often don't leave the paper they're written on. Anarcho-syndicalists are uninterested in platonic appeals to laws or constitutions. They want actual change. So by merging the political and labor organization into one, worker syndicates can achieve their objectives better than political parties or trade unions alone. This is further reinforced by their internal structure. Unlike a political party or other trade unions, syndicates are not top-down organizations, but voluntary and federalized bottom-up structures. The final responsibility of a worker syndicate is to, quote, educate their workers. Which, in socialist parlance, really means politicizing them. Either way, as soon as a worker joins his syndicate, he will not only benefit from the advancement of his interests, but from political education, too. But a single worker syndicate does not make up a society. Rather, it's just a building block. In an anarcho-syndicalist society, each locality will have a syndicate for every trade. Each syndicate maintains the inalienable right to self-determination, so they can never be subject to any authority that they do not themselves consent to. With that in mind, each locality's syndicates will be organized into a cartel. The cartel's function is to coordinate political activity and education for the locality. These labor cartels are then grouped by district and or region for the National Federation of Labor Cartels. This organization will, naturally, coordinate activity across the nation, especially for when stronger cartels are needed to assist the weaker ones. Syndicates are not just organized vertically, but horizontally too. All syndicates throughout the nation are allied with other syndicates of the same type in an industrial alliance. The industrial alliances are then themselves in looser alignment with other industrial alliances of similar types. For example, the industrial alliance of all farming syndicates will be aligned with the industrial alliance of all the food producers. All of the industrial alliances together form the Federation of Industrial Alliances. The vertical National Federation of Labor Cartels and horizontal industrial alliances form the two poles around which an anarcho-syndicalist economy revolves. It should be noted that these two institutions are supposed to be formed even while the capitalist state is in charge, and that they should be the ones to lead the effort to overthrow it. Then, with the capitalist system destroyed, they become the new social structure. When this happens, it becomes the job of the Federation of Labor Cartels and the Industrial Alliances to manage the economy of the new society. Thus, the Federation of Labor Cartels will calculate the total material needs of the society, while the Industrial Alliances will produce it. All of this means that whereas most societies are structured like a pyramid, a narco-syndicalist society is structured like a grid. In my opinion, the best way to describe this economy is decentralized central planning. Individuals have limited control over their economic activity. It's all planned for them. But instead of a central authority doing the planning, it's done by a series of distributed authorities. Thus, decentralized central planning. 
That's the economic structure, but how would civil liberties fare under anarcho-syndicalism? Very well, it turns out. The quintessential state communist, Lenin, famously said that free speech is a bourgeois prejudice. Anarchists viciously attacked him for saying this. They view such attacks on civil liberties as evil, and perhaps the worst aspect of their statist counterparts. Speaking of the Soviet Union, anarcho-syndicalists are quick to point out that their bottom-up structure is the total opposite of the top-down Soviet system, and view the USSR as a perfect example of everything not to do in a socialist society. So with the syndicates controlling everything, does that mean they're technically states, making anarcho-syndicalism a sham? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. But in my opinion, it comes down to a key factor. Is membership to the worker syndicates mandatory? Can, say, a farmer choose to farm himself without membership to a larger organization, and then trade on his own behalf? If so, this is definitely anarchism. If not, well, once again, that's debatable, and I'll leave it up to you. So what would an anarcho-syndicalist military look like? This is actually easy to answer, because there are two real-life examples of successful anarchist militaries. The first is the famous Ukrainian Black Army of the Russian Civil War. The Black Army is best described as halfway between a professional military and a Cossack-style host, although its place within its anarchist society was unique in that it was sort of a separate institution from everything else. It acted pretty much independently, and saw its role as that of an outside protector of the anarchist communes. Internally, the Black Army's structure was federal, in the field, it performed extremely well, even against the best armies in the region, including the much larger and better equipped Russian White and Soviet Red armies. The other example would be the CNT FAI militia of the Spanish Civil War. They were an official anarcho-syndicalist organization, and fielded up to 120,000 militia soldiers. They were a key part of the Republican forces during the Spanish Civil War, and performed about as well as any militia outfit should. And finally, while there are no historical examples of this, if you prefer the idea of a professional military in the Western tradition, I don't see any reason why there couldn't be soldier syndicates. But for any of this to matter, the anarcho-syndicalists must first overthrow the existing order. They have several powerful weapons in their arsenals to do this. Since they're fundamentally just political trade unions, the strike and all of its variations are their primary weapon. But sabotage, propaganda, boycotts, and even armed struggle are also options. Sabotage bears special mention, because it can come in a wide variety of forms, from work slowdowns to sit-down strikes. A sit-down strike is where the workers show up to their workstations and refuse to do anything. This makes it impossible for scabs to replace them, since they'd be in the way. Ending such a strike would require physical removal. The potential backlash from such a violent action is a risk few are willing to take. In a sense, anarcho-syndicalist sabotage can be summed up with the classic slogan, for bad wages, bad work. And, perhaps the most exotic tool in the anarcho-syndicalist arsenal is the social strike. Social strikes are only possible because unlike trade unions, worker syndicates are part political party. A social strike is a strike not to the benefit of the workers, but to force the employer to take on some social interest, perhaps to provide a cleaner product to the consumers, or to commit proceeds to providing for the needy. Such is the unique power of a worker's syndicate. So that's all of the key elements of anarcho-syndicalism. If you'd like to know more, I'd highly recommend Rudolf Rocker's Anarcho-Syndicalism, Theory and Practice. On top of going further into depth on the topics we discussed here, it also gives a great history of the movement. And that's anarcho-syndicalism! Don't forget to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, support us through Patreon, Subscribestar, becoming a channel member, PayPal, and cryptocurrency, links to all of which can be found below. Up next, we were supposed to talk about an idea inspired by anarcho-syndicalism, one which the anarchists aren't all that proud of. But a certain game development studio made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. So first, we're going to talk about that time in the 1800s when the Indians made an army so good that it almost kicked the British out of India. But then, instead of actually doing that, their own leaders decided to intentionally lose the war so they could get their army killed. I'll see you then. And just because he's a human, he doesn't like a pistol to his head. He wants no servants under him, and no boss over his head. So left to three, so left to three.